Sunday scripture comes from the book of John, the second chapter. Uh, this is, happens right after the turning of the water to wine, starting with verse 13 through uh, verse 22. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, J Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It has taken us 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. <clears throat> the words of God for the people of God, and all God's people said, praise be to God. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you once again. We ask that the words of my mouth be your word, and they fall upon, fall upon open ears and minds, and especially open hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was at a restaurant the other day with, with some people, and, and, and one of them had a small child. And now, we have small children here, and we know about small children. We know some of the things they do, I think. Uh, well, this young boy got into a game of peekaboo. Okay? And it wasn't too long before he had the giggles. And, 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 and of course, I got the giggles also. There's just something about a, a young child's laughter that just makes me laugh. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the, the genuineness of it or whatever. Anyway, this child's world is so small at this point that he doesn't realize the mechanics of what's happening around him. He, he's in the middle of his world, and that's good. That's the way it's supposed to be. However, we do eventually grow up. And peekaboo isn't our game of choice anymore. But we still play a game of peekaboo of sorts as adults. <clears throat> uh, I mean, we get so caught up in our own little worlds that we don't recognize many of the things that don't fall into this world that we've built. Now this morning we are going to take a look at the truth as we see it in this very famous passage. Let's see if we can recognize the truth or if you can even take the truth. As I come from a movie, I guess it was something like that. Anyway, uh, how many of you have ever been to one of those houses that defy gravity and logic? I think they're called gravity houses, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they're the ones where, you know, I stand in one corner and, and Sharon stands in the other corner and I look like I'm about 10 feet tall and she looks like she's about 3 feet tall. And then we switch corners and just the opposite uh, happens as, as we do that. And, and they've got these crooked stairs in there and, and there's nothing as it seems and, and reality is totally out of whack. Ever been one of those? Or how about, uh, ever been to one of those uh, at a carnival where they have these those goofy mirrors set up, you know? Uh, I would walk in front of one and I, I was 10 feet tall and skinny as a rail and then I'd go to the next one and I was about 2 feet tall and about 400 pounds. And my favorite one is always where I have a long skinny neck on a big fat head and a big fat body and, and, and just skinny little legs. These have always been fun and I recommend that you take the children there when they are young enough to be puzzled because it's fun. Anyway, I think the lesson behind all these things is that things aren't always what they seem. If you are looking for a true image in one of these goofy mirrors, you will never find it. Now. Something jumped out at me this, morning, or this week as I was reading this passage. Uh, there's a huge miracle here that we don't often talk about. We always read this like Jesus came into the temple and he cleared the tables and chased out the crooks that were doing business there. We remember this as a time when Jesus got angry. And now none of this is wrong, it's all true. But we seem to gloss over something that happened here. 
in looking at this in the traditional uh, sense, we, we, we seem to come to the conclusion that this temple was a small place and the tables, there are several tables around. However, the temple was a huge place and the court was massive. Some say it was larger than a football field or several football fields. This area was filled with money changers and those who sold sacrifices. Okay, this is the time of Passover, so there would be about an extra million people in Jerusalem. Therefore, there would be many, many of these traders that were needed to keep everyone happy. So in these courts, there were thousands of people. Also remember that the temple had guards, temple guards, or in our terms, a large pro, uh, police force that would border on a militia. So we have thousands of people. We have the traitors and the crooks and the large police force, not to mention the Roman soldiers there who would help keep the peace for Rome. It was very noisy with people running all over the place. And did I mention the animals? The animals, there were animals everywhere to be sold for sacrifice. Now hundreds of years before this, all, all, all this training was done outside. But now that the rabbis and the priests and so on are getting the cut of the, uh, of the pot, they've moved it inside the temple. You know, why don't we just go out and get a bunch of our cattle and bring them on in? This place was crazy. So Jesus walks into this brood of vipers. He sees what is happening and, and he gets angry just like we know from the story. But just think about this next part. Jesus topples the tables. He sends the money scattering all over the place. He chases out all the animals. And he does this all by himself with no help. And no one, no one stops him. This is a miracle, folks. If anybody else does this, they'd be taken down by the guards or the Roman soldiers or, or both. But not Jesus. He has God working with him to hold back the opposition. This is a major miracle that we don't read about. We don't think about it. The temple had become unrecognizable to God. The temple looked like we do when you stand in front of one of those mirrors at the carnival. It had a great big long neck and a great big fat belly with full of money and greed. You see, the true temple was there, but it had become so distorted, it's kind of like our image in the funny mirrors. The true you is there, but it's distorted. So the question becomes, what is making you distorted? Do you have a hurt from the past that keeps nagging at you, keeping you from having a normal life? Or, or maybe you've got an anger problem that interferes with daily activities? Or, or maybe you're grieving the loss of a loved one and, and you just can't seem to get past it. There are, there are hundreds of emotions and issues that might keep you from having a normal life with Jesus. But here's the key, and we talk about this on Wednesday night. Don't be afraid to join us on our Wednesday night services at 7.30 this week at, 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 uh, at Zion. Uh, they've been some interesting conversations. But, but the key is, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be honest with yourself. When you go to pray, you have to let your emotions go. You, if, if you're going to be mad at God, then be mad at God. Okay, But tell him about it. He's built to take it. He can take it. We have to get these things off our chest. Sometimes it takes lots of time and lots of prayer, but we have to keep bringing our baggage to God. Uh, I think that our, our, our churches have come uh, to this point today. I came across this quote this past week from a, uh, somebody named A.B. Simpson, and he says, the chief danger of the church today is that it, it is trying to get on the same side as the world instead of trying to turn the world upside down. Jesus didn't come to the temple to try to negotiate with these people. He didn't come there to try to tell them that all was well and everyone had a right to be there. He came in to wreck the place and throw the crooks out. They had no place in the kingdom of God. Now there's going to be many a pastor and a, a church official, seemingly holy members who are going to find themselves sitting outside after, outside of, uh, after Jesus tosses them out. People, we have absolutely no right to, to tell Jesus what sin is and what it isn't. He tells us. Amen. He tells us. Thank you. 
So we've ended up today with many churches with these carnival mirrors out in front of him. Uh, there's a church in there deep down inside, but no one can recognize it anymore because it's become so distorted. We're more concerned about, you know, the big screens and the, and the contemporary music and entertainment value than we are about actually talking about Jesus. It's no wonder we don't recognize our churches when they are little more than carnivals where you can go get your designer coffee. Okay, enough of my diatribe this morning. The question that should come to mind here is that why in the world did John put this in the second chapter when it happened way later in the story during Holy Week? John starts out this chapter by talking about the wedding in Canaan, okay, where Jesus turned the water to wine. He's showing us that Jesus has command over the physical world. Jesus can do anything with any part of the world. He is in total command of the elements. It's the same way with this scene. John tells us about this right up front because he wants us to know right away that Jesus is in command of all human situations. Yes, he got angry. Yes, he's showing us a little justice. He's showing us that we are wrong. But most of all, Jesus or John, or John is telling us that Jesus is in command of everything, including the enemy troops. They never tried to stop him. Jesus has that much power. We see this again when all the soldiers fell down before him at Gethsemane. We need to know this and remember this at all times. So, we have the water to wine at Canaan. We have the tipping of the tables at the temple. And finally, the Jews catch up with Jesus. They want to know by what authority does Jesus have to do these such things. And just as a little sidebar here, in my personal opinion, I think many of the Jewish leaders deep down knew who Jesus was, but they didn't dare say anything. It's, it's kind of like if we had a church today that had been around for several hundred years, you know, do you think they would be up for radical change? Do you think they'd be up for that? If I went to the annual conference in, in June and told them the errors of the way, do you think anyone would listen to me? You know, of course they wouldn't. They wouldn't listen to me at all because it could, it could mean they might lose their jobs. You know, this should never happen, but economics will win over God most of the time. And, and the, uh, the reason for this is that we worship money and works. We are so distorted that we wouldn't know the truth if he came riding in on a, on a donkey a week before Easter. The Jews want to know who sent him. They want to know if they should obey him or not. They ask him for his authority. In those days, that was a big deal, a big question. If you came and did something out of the ordinary, you had to have some authority from someplace. And this usually came from the leading rabbis or the chief priests, but never from God. So the, one of the big rubs about Jesus is that he claims his authority is straight from God. And the leaders seem to think that they know this can't happen. And then to top everything else off, Jesus knows the scriptures better than any of the priests or the rabbis. This scene just puts the final touches on the crucifixion plan. And they will execute this plan in a couple of days, even if it's at the beginning of the book of John. Once again, Jesus doesn't answer them in a way that makes them happy. But then again, uh, they wouldn't be happy no matter what Jesus said. At this point, there was nothing that would make them happy and just about anything would make them even matter. So instead of answering their question, Jesus reveals the truth to them. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. Also observe that Jesus said, He will raise it up. He said, I will raise it up, not the Father. I will raise it up. This just goes to show you that Jesus was God. He is God. And of course, this falls on deaf ears uh, of the, as the Jews thought that he was talking about the physical temple that he had just disrupted. There's a couple of little tidbits here about the disciples. The disciples remembered after he had tipped the tables over that Jesus had told them about this previously. They would remember after the resurrection that he had told them that he would rise from the dead after three days or that the temple would be rebuilt in three days. 
And a part of the reason that Jesus did these things was to show his disciples that once again, uh, uh, he, the, he knew what was going to happen. He's saying he, he knows the future. He knows what's coming up. He says, just hang in there with me. Well, yeah, just hang in there. I know what I'm doing. Stay faithful to me, to me and I'll be back in three days. I think this is very important for us also today. Just about every Sunday I, I talk about the, some woe in the world, some things going wrong. We've really built quite a mess and, and I don't think it's going to get any better with, with a new president who tells us what we want to hear and then forgets everything. We rely too much on what the world can do. It's all around us. But, but think about this in a little different light, if you can. Trouble surrounds us wherever we go and whatever we do. But do you know what the good news is here and what Jesus is trying to tell us? Jesus also surrounds us wherever we go and whatever we do. If Jesus can walk on water, if he can heal the sick with a touch, with a look or even a thought, if he can change water into wine, and if the armies of the world bow down before him, don't you think that maybe he can handle some of your troubles? Jesus is not only in charge of all these things, but he has conquered death. People, he has conquered death. I beg you to trust Jesus and all you... All you have, because he can solve anything if you just give it to him. Step away from your carnival mirror. Step away from your gravity house. Let the real you show and, and, and take it all to Jesus and leave it at his doorstep. A fellow named Clark Tanner tells a story that took place sometime long ago. In a galaxy far, far away, there was a planet of crooked people. They all pretty much looked alike, except their left arms were bent up in some weird way compared to the right arm. It was hard for them to use their left arm for anything. Um, however, there was also a small percentage of the people where the left arm was okay, but the right arm was all bent up and they, it was hard to use. Um, but everyone had one crooked arm. And centuries went by and, and the people learned to adjust with these, with these things and, and, and things went about as, as best they could. One day, a spaceship lands and a man comes out with two straight arms. Okay? Uh, um, he tells them, that they actually belonged to a king from a different world, but they had been separated centuries before. He wants to reconcile the situation and bring them back to their home planet. He also wants to fix those crooked arms so that they are useful again and normal. Their quality of life would increase immensely as they would be able to live with their king in, in his planet. He's showing them an image that's not distorted by a, some carnival mirror. One man comes from the king and he has all the answers. We live in a world of this allegory. One of my favorite sayings is that if you are a lemming and all the other lemmings jump in the sea and drown, do you follow them? Don't follow the world to doom. Instead, follow Jesus Christ. He is God. All other things are false. Regardless of what other people do, regardless of how they have distorted the mirror, the truth, follow Jesus and you will be in the right you will have an eternity of bliss. Jesus Christ loves you more than you will ever know in this world and the next. Trust in him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Jesus, for first loving us. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we, we thank you so much for this love you give us, this world you've given us, Lord. Help us to follow you. Help us to follow you and only you and not get distracted by the things around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> now please turn to 261, stand as you are able. 261. <coughs> 